We, we get a lot of kind donations from people who were skiing in the past and uh, don't want to do it anymore. Um, but then we, we always look at our equipment and there'll be a certain, certain shortfalls. Um, years ago it was a big battle to get big boots um, because children's feet just seem to get bigger as the generations go on. So we're often looking for size 11, 12s, 1, 13s in adult boots um, and then tiny boots sometimes. But yeah, we get a lot of donations and then we target and decide who's coming in and what we need. And if we can get it, we get it. And if we can fix it, we fix it. And if we can't fix it and we can't get it, then we don't do it. My name is Eric Barlow, I'm 61 and I'm from Carlisle. My job at the Carlisle Ski Centre, I help run the dry ski slope, which also involves instructor training, maintenance, just doing everyday things, just keeping the ski centre going. It's a machine that has lots of components and you, you, there's always something new and different to do. It's just enjoyable. Basically seven days a week, for seven months, there's something going on. Who I am is part of my DNA, I think. My dad taught me to ski initially and then eventually I was catching up and got better than him. And so he was proud of me when I was learning and then my dad told me that they were going to be building a ski slope here and we came down and became part of a working party to clip the ski slope together. had skied on snow that winter before and was a, I thought at the time that I'm only ever going to get to ski two or three days a year in the local fells and I came down here and I put the matting down and got to talk to all the people and different people. I then started skiing on the slope once a week having lessons and my skiing prowess really took off. Um, here with a selection of different skis actually, mainly carving skis but park and pipe, various types of skis and then we have a little museum going on here, this is a ski mountaineering ski where the hill moves and um, you can walk up the hill put a skin on it, this is probably the most famous ski boot ever made which is a Solomon SX91 a keep with a zipper on it. So that's soft flex and that's hard flex and these were the bees knees, this is what everybody wanted to ski on in the, the 90s. Skiing changed my life. I, at the age of 14, decided that I wanted to become a ski instructor. At the age of 16, I went to works experience session, which is where you went with your parents to meet somebody at school who would discuss potential pathways for you. And I told that work experience person that I wanted to be a ski instructor. And when they picked themselves up off the floor laughing, saying you don't get many of those jobs in Cumbria, the guy suggested I serve my time as an engineer or an apprentice in something, and then take up your foolish ideas of becoming a ski instructor. So I actually did that. I served my time as an engineer but everybody in the engineering plant knew that I was leaving the day I got my city and girls in engineering and that's what I did. I served my time there, hated it, and also worked on the dry ski slope on a weekend teaching many children's classes. And I did my ASSI, which is Artificial Ski Slope Instructors Qualification. The way the industry ran was half terms they could just not get enough instructors sometimes. A Scottish ski school got in touch with me and asked me if I wanted to come up and help at weekends. And, and so I used to go off and do a bit of ski teaching up in Scotland up for weekends. I've had children say to me, will I die if I go on the ski slope? And I'll say, no, I don't think you'll die. 
we haven't had any deaths yet. So, um, but that's one of the joys of children. You can you can nurture them and wind them up at the same time. Cost twenty thousand pounds a year to pet a child up. How old are you? <laughs> Fourteen. You're worth two hundred eighty thousand pounds. There's about a million and a half pounds worth of children. In there. <laughs> All children should be allowed to try everything, so the coming to a dry ski slope to have a go at skiing and possibly attaining a badge, it's a fantastic thing that children can do. We also get people that come and say, I've been on a ski holiday and it was horrendous and I was frightened, and we can work with those people and give them loads of tools in the toolbox, so that if they, although it's a little, oblong shaped piece of matting, we discuss mountain scenarios, weather conditions, ice, um, steepness of slope, tiredness, fatigue and everything else and we send people off to the mountains with a good set of brakes and an understanding of continuous turning and when they go off we're actually interested in whether or not they had a great time when they went on holiday and one of the beauties of a dry ski slope is the skiers I meet, I meet every week but when I worked in the mountains I would meet somebody on a Monday, teach them to ski and have a few drinks with them and then on the Friday they would go and we would never meet again on this planet. So there's a, that continuous friendship that you can develop on a dry ski slope, camaraderie and everything else. Skiing on a dry ski slope is... <sighs> We sometimes call ourselves Dendex Warriors, and Dendex being the name of the matin. Um, we're hardcore because snow instructors teach for three months of the year normally, but we go for seven months. We start in the middle of summer and work all the way through. The design of skis and the design of how we teach people to ski is totally changed, industry led. Um, we are now of modern shaped skis that are a lot easier to ski on. The, what we teach on dry ski slopes, we, we, we teach not a system that is, the Swiss have a certain system, the Italians, the French, we just teach good skiing and people will come to us and say, well, I was, wasn't told that last year when I was in France. So we don't say, do this, don't do that. Don't listen to the French, listen to the Swiss, listen to the Americans. We just teach people. The actual, to be able to ski on a dry ski slope, you learn not to fall over very quickly. And it's unforgiving. We can have people who have skied for years and do windy wipey turns and they can get away with it on snow. But you won't get away with it on a dry ski slope as much and you'll possibly fall and, and scratch and so it doesn't suffer fools lightly but we can produce the product we produce is really good skiers with a good foundations who usually can do lots of short radius turns because it's a small slope and you want to get as many turns in as you can and, and for that Dry ski slopes are unique. They're also unique because if you go on a skiing holiday for seven days, you're exhausted on day three and your lactic acid is built up. But here you can learn to ski one or two hours a week over a year. And it's an easier learning path where you don't burn out. To put a pair of skis on and, and go in to the mountains and ski down is, uh, it, it is addictive, it, sometimes there's an old saying where it, it gets into your blood where the, there's a, it, it's not a, a drug per se but it, it gets into your system and it, I think it's the, the joy of the more skiing I do, the more hours I teach I realise the less I know and that enables me to continue to enjoy and learn because as I say the more I do it and the more I teach it the more I realize the less I know about it um, and that's the joy of skiing I think. The center here is the epicenter of, of what I do but basically to continue teaching skiing and traveling the world and going up to ski resorts, uh, I would be emotionally on the top run of the ladder as the happiest person in the world. 
and financially been on the bottom run of the ladder. So it was unsustainable to be involved in skiing and traveling the world, or I found it was. But what I found here was I could get all the benefits of teaching somebody to ski and uh, uh, a blank canvas. And because I'm a, a train spotter with a better anorak, the ski instructor's anorak, a captive audience stuck on the side of the hill and I can talk to them about skiing and, and try and develop the skiing, um, and enjoy watching them enjoying the skiing and then I can come off the ski slope and I can be back home in five minutes having a cup of tea. And so it ticks all the boxes. Now, had I been born in France and living in the Three Valleys, I'm sure I would have had a lifetime in the snow sports. Been in Cumbria, if there hadn't been a dry ski slope here, it would have been very difficult for me to have a lifetime of fun and enjoyment in snow sports because life gets in the way. Twice in a decade, the Rickergate area of Carlisle was badly hit by flooding. People here have had to learn to live with the fear of having their homes swallowed up. Just a few hundred yards away is the River Eden, running through nearby Bits Park. It's from here that flood water can spill into streets on the fringe of the city centre. But the Environment Agency has been improving flood defences as part of a £25 million scheme to give Carl better protection following the devastation of Storm Desmond in 2015. Carlisle is now better protected than ever before, but coping with storms worse than Desmond would require work to hold water back further upstream. Mark McElland and BBC Look North, Carlisle. The slope has a, a wild history, if you wanted to say. There's a slope, it's in the grounds of the cricket ground, and it's beside the River Eden. Now, historically, for 30 years, there was no problem with the water coming in and filling the ground up. And, and damaging the ski slope. But over the last 30 years, the, the, because of possible better drainage and farmland or the motorway water coming into the river, but for whatever reason, we started to flood and we've had four major floods over 20 years, once every five years, over 20 years. Those floods come right round about November, December time, which is right in the middle of our ski season, which then totally shuts us down for the ski season which stops the club generating income and takes a lot of time and effort to get everything up and running again so we kind of lose the season um, which is really upsetting that box used to be down at the bottom of that fence that's where our pally used to be and it always flooded and we got the electric wiped out so then we put some torpedoes in and all the cables in to above the flood line, so uh, that's why that box is. So now we don't have to replace our electrics if we if we get flooded. You're not one stealers. <laughs> he was on here yesterday afternoon. No, I teach on here. Of course. <laughs> right. So this wall here. Um, Plaster wall and, and it, when the water was in and it, it just burst it off really. Uh, it's still a solid wall but it's not very pretty. And my options were to get filler in it. I painted it but then I wasn't happy with that. And then I thought, do you know what? A good way of disguising it is I have an abundance of old skis. Um, and I could make like a fence panel um, that just makes it look pretty. Yeah. Oh, the problems after the flood, um, if the flood's been eight foot inside the building, it's a single storey building, it's right up to the, the ceiling, but it's in the building for about three to four days because the ground is like a big goldfish ball and it fills up and even though the river's going down, the water can't get out the ground. The actual 
you ordered a skip, you chuck everything in the skip, you get a diesel pressure washer, you wash all the walls down and then you try and put heat into the building but you lose, because we don't have a four or five hour window to get out, we lose stuff and then we need to get the electrics looked at and the water system looked at and and then we have to get dehumidifiers in and dry the room and then we go to the ski slope and we have to fix the electrics over there and it can take three or four months to, to re-establish the ski centre. We do tend to get the boots and we have trailers and, and members who will come down and try and get as much out as we can but, but sometimes it's physically not possible. Normally this racking I put in because the water tends not to go above there so I can put stuff up there, I can put stuff up here if it's flooded and I actually have a trailer that's not here at the moment that comes through these doors and can sit it's a box trailer and then if I get five hours notice that the river's going to come in I get a group of volunteers and they all come and we load this con the big trailer, box trailer, comes about here uh, with the ski boots and then I whiz it off to my sister's house and she kindly lets me keep it in the garage. Well the cost, it, that is a financial cost because there's a loss of earnings and replacement sometimes of equipment, there's a cost to that. I genuinely think I, I can lie at home in bed and I know that it's been raining and I watch the weather profusely and watch the height of the river and there are nights that I struggle to sleep because I'm worried that we're going to lose or should I be going down at three in the morning and putting everything as high as I can and so it is a constant river watch I mean it is global warming and, and people whether believe it or not it's the, the climate or the river levels have changed around here and it does affect the skiing. Fifty years ago the snow was on the ground throughout the winter and every Sunday or it seemed like every Sunday I could go off with my dad and we'd find snow on the fells and we would just ski it and it, that was the norm. I know when I worked in Scotland we did seasons of the snow from December to till, till April. In Cumbria, I mean the city has done a lot to try and hold back the, the river and there's, there are people in homes that have been flooded and there's been a lot of money spent quite rightly to protect those homes. We as a club don't really want to ban the drum and say well, what about us? But this part, this side of the river is a designated floodplain, Rickaby Park and this cricket ground because there's nobody actually lives here. It's accepted that the water's got to go somewhere and it's got to come our way. So it's just something we live with. It's historically it's always flooded and everything else. So just before it floods we tend to put all the skis on the floor and all the boots go up here in the trailer and the helmets and then um, Mother Nature does her thing and then once the water's gone we come back in and uh, pressure wash things and give it a lick of paint and put some heat in the building, dry it out. Basically as long as we have a boot changing room and a working toilet with a bit of lighting then we can get people to come in and and get onto some gear and uh, go out and have a bit of fun on the dry ski floor. Very relaxed all well done. I think all things need a driver and I have been a very strong influence driver of the club. If I were, on one day I won't be here, if then the club was to shut down then it's because nobody has a bigger passion about it than I do perhaps. But I would never enforce that, I might as say my children who are qualified instructors but don't really help me down at the club a lot now because they've got full time jobs and reached and worked on their passion of life. So. Tomorrow somebody could come into the ski club and get really involved and, and want to take it into different places and, and that would be lovely and I would just pull back but I, who knows what happens in the future. I did a, a lot of ski seasons in Scotland and people would always ask me uh, 
Do you ever get any good weather? And I would say, yeah, we've had two days this season. Um, here, um, we ski when the sun's shining and the ski slope is very dry and we have a water system. But then you get bonus days when you've got snow on the slope. There's children coming down this afternoon and they're going to have a fantastic time skiing about, um, just enjoying this you know, fresh air and the, the snow and everything else. It's beautiful. Lifetime in skiing. Very good at throwing snowballs. Usually, because the children are throwing them at you. I think really having the dry ski slope here has allowed me to achieve the dream I had when I was 14, which was I wanted to spend a lifetime in snow sports. I'm 62 and uh, I'll probably die with my skis on, but they'll be at a point where I won't be able to go out and do any more lessons. The memories, the, the people I've met, the nice people I've met, the families I've met, it's a lifestyle of and a social hope and a, it's, it's just who I am, it's part of my DNA, I think. There's been a ski slope in Carlisle for 50 years. I started skiing here 50 years ago. Despite floods, climate change and everything else, we're still here. I would love to think that people coming to the ski slope have as much fun and enjoyment and, and learn skills and enjoy themselves as much as I have. I've had a lifetime of fun in skiing and hopefully they will as well.